50 minute or less lecture series anatomy and physiology chapter 13 cardiovascular system part one the cardiovascular system is a closed circuit including the heart and blood vessels so the blood is flowing all the way around in a circle kind of throughout the body the function of the cardiovascular system is to supply oxygen and nutrients to the tissues of the body to keep them healthy and alive and to remove wastes from the tissues so they can get eliminated by the kidneys so it's all about transportation. There are two main circuits to the cardiovascular system. There's the pulmonary circuit that carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs in order to get oxygenated and return to the heart. And then the systemic circuit that carries the oxygenated blood throughout the body. And then eventually the deoxygenated blood returns to the heart to continue on through the pulmonary circuit again. Uh, the heart is found in the thoracic cavity near the midline. It is in the pericardial cavity and also in the mediastinum, which is the space between the two lungs. Uh, the pericardium consists of a fibrous outer pericardium that's made of dense, tough, connected tissue. And then under that is a serous pericardium, a double layer membrane structure with a little bit of fluid in between the two layers, with the parietal layer lying next to the fibrous pericardium and the visceral layer lying against the heart itself. Uh, so again, for a serous membrane, you have the pericardium, uh, serous pericardium, the heart gets pushed into it and wraps around it, so it's like a water-filled hug. And it's important for reducing friction as the heart is beating and rubbing against the structures around it. All right, the layers of the heart wall. The outer, most superficial layer is the epicardium. The epicardium is composed of the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, as well as additional fibroelastic and adipose tissue on the surface of the heart. That is deep to that is the myocardium. The myocardium is the thickest layer where all the muscle tissue is found. And then finally, there's a thin endocardium lining the inside of the heart, made up of a thin layer of endothelium. And it is there to help minimize the friction inside the heart with all the blood cells, etc., rushing through, beating against the heart walls. The heart is basically two side-by-side -side trunks, uh, pumps, that are pumping blood through the two major circuits. There's the right atrium that leads to the right ventricle, and the left atrium that leads to the left ventricle. The atria receive blood from veins, the ventricles pump blood out through the arteries. Here's another picture of an actual heart. You can see there's these two sort of flaps near the uh, superior side of the heart. These are the auricles. They are basically uh, there to increase the volume of the atria. When you look at the heart, there are also uh, four valves. Two of these are atrioventricular valves. So between the right atrium and the right ventricle is the tricuspid valve. And between the left atrium and the left ventricle is the bicuspid valve, also known as a mitral valve. Big difference is the tricuspid has three cusps or flaps. The bicuspid has two cusps or flaps. Uh, the flaps are connected to the heart walls by little bitty pieces of connective tissue called cordy tendony that are kind of like little strings holding the flaps and attaching them to the papillary muscles, little muscles that contract when necessary. Um, the semilunar valves are the other two valves of the heart. They are found between the border of the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk, and that is the pulmonary valve. And then between the left ventricle and the artery, and that is the aortic valve, which you can't quite see in this picture. They have three little cuff-like structures that fill with blood in order to prevent blood from backflowing into the ventricles. And now we'll talk about how blood flows through the heart. So we have blood arriving from the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus into the right atrium. The blood will then pass through the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. This is all deoxygenated blood that will then pass through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk. And the pulmonary trunk will then send the blood to the left and right pulmonary arteries going to the lungs in order to get oxygenated within the lungs. The oxygenated blood will then return via the pulmonary veins right and left into the left atrium. The blood will then flow through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. And then this oxygenated blood will leave the heart through the aortic valve and enter the aorta to be distributed throughout the body and go through the systemic circulation and then return to the right atrium. And this is a continuous cycle of blood leaving and returning at the same time. 
All right, if you remove the atria, the top part of the heart, and look down, you'll be able to see the four valves, the two uh, atrioventricular valves and the two semilunar valves, and you'll see that around them are these rings of connective tissue. These are referred to as the uh, fibrous skeleton of the heart, and they're important because they help to attach the heart's valves together and as well as insertion points for the cardiac muscle fibers, and they help to prevent the valves from overstretching. Uh, we also have the coronary circuit. This supplies blood to the heart itself. So almost immediately after the blood enters the aorta, some of it will go through the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery to arrive around the heart organ itself. Uh, they will then split up into various branches of arteries. And it is best for this blood flow to occur when the heart is relaxed because when the heart is contracting, it bulges out a bit and squeezes these vessels closed. Um, after the uh, arteries branch to smaller arteries and smaller and smaller and smaller, they eventually enter really tiny arteries that are sort of a network mesh called anastomoses to uh, be able to supply the various parts of the um, heart with the blood and oxygen and nutrients it needs. Then they will enter the veins and slowly return to the uh, blood flow in the heart. So they will eventually reach the coronary sinus, which is a large vein that lacks muscle tissue. And that coronary sinus will then empty its blood into the right atrium. Myocardial infarction. This is a heart attack. This is caused by complete blockage of blood flow in one of the major coronary arteries. So a complete blockage of blood flow. And this always leads to death of part of the cardiac tissue. So part of the heart is going to lose strength, lose function. And it is possible that uh, myocardial infarction will lead to death. Also, there's usually an associated pain with a heart attack called angina pectoris. The cardiac cycle, the beating of the heart. Uh, again, remember, these are two side-by-side -side pumps that are working in unison. So first, there's atrial systole, where the atria are contracting, sending blood to the ventricles. Then there's ventricular systole, when the ventricles contract, sending blood into the arteries. And then the entire heart will go through a brief moment of diastole when it's completely relaxed. And then this continues again and again. This is the beating of the heart, the cardiac cycle. So initially, the atria will fill with blood because the blood pressure in the veins arriving is greater than in the atria themselves. Then some of the blood will flow from the atria into the ventricles. Again, this is all in diastole. Then the atria will contract versus uh, the atrial systole. The pressure in the atria will increase, sending the rest of the blood into the ventricles where there is less pressure. In a pressure gradient, the materials will move from high pressure to low pressure. Similar to concentration gradients, things going from high concentration to low concentration. After this, the ventricles will contract. This will increase the pressure in the ventricles, sending the blood into the arteries. The blood will not go into the atria because of the atrial ventricular valves. Um, so at this point, the bl uh, blood pressure is higher in the ventricles than in the atrial uh, at um, arteries, so the blood enters the arteries. And finally, the all four chambers of the heart will relax. This is the distole, and this causes a drop in pressure in the ventricles. However, the uh, semilunar valves will prevent the blood from backflowing from the arteries back into the ventricles. And then uh, blood will start to flow in from the atria again because the pressure in the atria will be higher than in the ventricles. And the cycle continues again and again and again, beating of the heart. When the heart beats, there are certain sounds that are produced. These are often called lub-dub. The lub sound is caused by the closing of the atrial ventricular valve. So when the atrial ventricular valves close, when the ventricles contract, that's the lub. And then the second sound, the dub sound, occurs when the ventricles relax and blood backflows into the pulmonary and uh, aortic valves. And the closing of those valves is the dub sound. So lub dub is the closing of the four valves in the heart. And if there's any abnormal uh, issues, any damage to the valves, then there might be a murmur sound, an additional little bit of a sound that's unexpected. So a heart murmur is a sign of damage to some heart, one or more heart valves. So again, lub dub. Lub occurs when there is lots of blood in the ventricles. They contract, causing all the blood to most all the blood to leave and enter the arteries. And then you get the dub sound as the semilunar valves uh, close to prevent backflow of blood, and then the ventricles will start to fill with blood again. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub.
All right, cardiac conduction system. Cardiac tissue carries electric current. This is what controlling when the contractions of the heart muscle occurs. Uh, so this is referred to as the cardiac conduction system. It all starts in the sinoatrial node found in the right atrium. This is the self-exciting mass that generates the um, cardiac impulse. This is the heart's natural pacemaker. The electrical impulse will be generated and then will spread to both of the atria, causing them to contract. It will also arrive at the atrial ventricular node. Here, there's a slight pause. This way, the atria contract before the ventricles do. Then the uh, electrical impulse will travel through the interventricular septum, the wall between the ventricles, down along the atrial ventricular uh, bundles. They will reach the apex or end of the heart, where they will enter the Purkinje fibers, which will then spread this current to the uh, muscle tissue in the ventricles, actually starting at the apex and causing the ventricles to contract up, bringing the blood out. Also, at the same time, the papillary muscles will contract to make sure the atrioventricular valves remain closed. And that is how it goes. SA node to atrial septum, that's the tissues that are spreading the uh, current through the atria to the junction fibers, finally to the atrioventricular node. There's a slight delay, then it goes to the atrioventricular bundle, to the bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers that spread it to the actual ventricular tissue, cardiac conduction system. You can actually measure this using electrocardiogram. There, we are able to detect the electric currents passing through the heart and see it in a graph formation. So electrocardiogram, recording the electrical changes during the cardiac cycle. The P wave here is the depolarization of the atria as they start to contract. The QRS jump is the depolarization of the ventricles, when the ventricles will be contracting. And then finally, the little T wave here is the ventricles repolarizing and relaxing. So we're able to see all that on a graph, which is pretty amazing. And you can uh, see the spaces between these different uh, expected features of the electrocardiogram, how far apart they are, whether they look kind of weird, and this sort of information can tell you if there's some issue in the heart. Uh, cardiac cycle is regulated first by the blood being pumped. Blood arrives and then sent to the uh, effectors. So we need a certain amount of blood in various parts of our body, depending on whether we're exercising, when we need the sympathetic division to get active and increase the heart rate, or whether we're resting and taking a nap, and then the parasympathetic division can take over and slow down the heart rate. Uh, the cardiac control center that controls the rate of the heart is in the medulla oblongata of the brain stem, and it is being triggered by barrier receptors detecting blood pressure, changes in blood pressure in the aorta and the um, other arteries. Impulses then go to the cerebrum or the hypothalamus to then influence the heart rate. Uh, we also can get influenced by our emotions. That can also affect the heart rate. And that is it for this part.